Streetwise Global Schools is the national programme of support for development education at post-primary level. It is a one-stop shop of funding, resources and guidance for post-primary schools to engage in development education. Poetry Ireland received funding from Worldwise Global Schools through Irish Aid to provide writers in residence for 12 schools in Dublin, Galway, Kerry, Louth, Monaghan and Tipperary. Post-primary students had the opportunity to work with Poetry Ireland's team of writers to explore global issues through creative writing. These are some children I met on their way to school one morning. Now this is at about seven o'clock in the morning. They start school at about half past seven. Now you can look and see the little boy in the front in the yellow t-shirt. That's a, a really old t-shirt. That looks like a man's t-shirt. It's way too big in him. The front of it is nearly down to his belly button and there's holes in the bottom of it. And that little boy at the front is a little bit like how I imagine Rafiq to be. And when I was up there traveling in the villages and the mountains and I saw all those children, scrabbling to get through life, just managing to find somewhere to sleep, a little dirty corner to sleep in, sleep, uh, drinking water that came out of a pool. And I thought, what would happen? Children's author Jane Mitchell discussed her book Chalkline with students at St. Michael's. As part of the project, the students asked their mothers, as members of the parents' school book club, to read Jane's novel. In the last session, both students and parents listened to Jane and there was a question and answer session afterwards. Now you've all finished the book, haven't you? I'm going to read a little bit because at the beginning of the story, one of the scariest things that happens is that Rafiq gets kidnapped. And that's the part I'm going to read for you. And this is where they're in the school and the, uh, the soldiers come in and they appear into the classroom. So the guys have taken a chalk line, a, a piece of chalk, and they've gone up to the wall and they've just drawn a line on the wall. They don't care, just right, that'll do. That's the line. And then they get all the kids out into the schoolyard. And then they call them in, get them to get up in line and call them in. So the boys shuffled into a ragged line, aided by prods and pokes from the gunman's rifles. Rafiq joined it, but his heart was low. He knew well before he got to it that he was taller than that line. Never in his life had he so regretted being tall for his age. Usually he was proud of it. Standing a good head above his friends was a great advantage when they played football because Rafiq always got chosen. But now height was a bad thing. The queue of boys in front of Rafiq moved forwards quickly. The little six and seven year olds weren't even measured. They were herded together under the care of the teachers and the watch of one of the gunmen. It was the turn of Rafiq's friends, the eight and nine-year-olds. As they moved into the classroom, he smelled chalk dust mingled with the odour of fear and the sweat of the militants. One by one, the children stepped forward and stood against the chalk line. The head of every nine-year-old in the school grazed the bottom of the mark and they were dismissed into the yard. They ran into the sunshine, smiling with relief. They were free. If you're lower than the chalk line, what happens to you? You're okay, you get to go home to your family. If you're taller than the chalk line, what happens? You go in the truck, yes, and you're being taken off up into the mountains. Right, can I have my first person to measure, please? <laughs> right, absolutely, first person into the truck, over that side. Next. Definitely into the truck. <laughs> right, what do you reckon? Is she smaller or taller? You're lucky, you're safe to go home. You can go back to your family. When we're trying to understand the world, sometimes it's a very good exercise to go inside the thing we fear and to go into the thing that we're attacking. They've done an act that seems to us unmerciful, but you believe that Allah, who is merciful, the merciful, is on your side, that you are doing somehow his work. It's a very tricky one to do, and that's why it's such a challenge that might be the best one to go for. But you know, sometimes we're not that comfortable to do something like that, and also sometimes 
We're simply not in the zone, we're simply not in the space to be creative. So what I want you to do, this is why I've given you three, I want you to take one that you think is the leap path of least resistance for your brains at this moment that you can get into. But remember, I'm only giving you three minutes. Right, you better get started so. John W. Sexton worked with students of Presentation Secondary School, Tralee, to explore the themes of education, gender and kidnapping through creative writing. This very topical theme thoroughly engaged the girls who explored these ideas in their creative response. How many of you wrote the letter to Good Luck Jonathan? Quite a few of you. How many of you attempted uh, defending Abu Bakr? Oh, a few of you. And I know one or two did a prayer for those children. Put your hand up if you, if you wrote the prayer. Sometimes we can't write about one thing. We're not in the space. And sometimes the gentle thing, a prayer, the protective thing, is where our creative space is. <coughs> and that's why I put that there as the last thing. And that's the next thing I want to say to you. Those of you who are interested in writing for yourselves, if you're sitting down to write, don't necessarily sit down to write the thing that you want to write. Give yourself two other things to do as well, just in case you're not in the space for the thing you want to write. Does that make sense to you? Because what happens, sometimes we sit down and we've got something we're working on and we're not quite in the space for that and we can't do it. And if we attempt to do it when we're not in the space, we actually damage the writing and we kind of damage ourselves, we wear ourselves out. Or we simply give up and we go away. He shouts and they are loud and angry and I don't quite understand but I scream like everyone else and he raises his gun and now we are trying to run but there are more men there, are uh, too many of them and rough hands are grabbing me and next thing I know I'm being dragged outside. I glimpse my friends around me, they are being dragged too and we're all crying and the shouting of the men is loud, so loud and then there is a crash. The window is smashing and it's Mr Collins' classroom. What I would suggest here is to remove Mr. Collins as a name because the name Collins doesn't suggest Nigeria. So what I would suggest you do is do a Google on Nigerian surnames and get one that sounds Nigerian. And the reason for that, as your reader is reading through this, suddenly that introduction of a strange name brings you into that different place. We've got to fight the temptation for everything to be too happy clappy because if we do, we're betraying the reality that this story is coming from. Never forget the reality that this story is coming from. <laughs>Have any of you been at the Francis Bacon studio in the Hugh Lane Gallery in the city? Okay, you have to go there. Whether you like art or not, you have to go there, right? Because it's probably the best piece of art they have in the gallery. Um, it's the studio of a famous painter, Francis Bacon, and it's a real messy, messy studio. There's no clean space anywhere in it, right? There's daubs of paint all over, there's half painted, fully painted, uh, there's empty tubes of paint and hundreds of brushes all over the place, right? It's wild and mad, but it's great for anybody interested in creative writing. Why? Because it's, it's, it's in fact an image of what your mind is like inside you when you're trying to write, okay? It's full of rubbish all over the place. Did I talk about rubbish early on? Yeah. It's full of rubbish, but my God does it tell you a lot about life, a lot about creativity. Today I'm going to put a small image on the wall here. It's no more than largish postcard size image. I want you to stand and look at it and stare it out until you've got some sense of what's there. And don't jump to any conclusions, right? Just keep your minds open. Now, the only help I'm giving you 
is telling you that the provisional title for the poem is Red Squirrels. Seamus Cashman worked with first and second year students at Loreto Secondary School, Balbriggan. The students learnt the writing process of poetry and, in the final session, read the poems about the theme of hunger that they had written throughout. Negatives in the world. Death. One man's nightmare, another man's dream. War. One nation's fear, another nation's saviour. Hurt. One person's torture, another person's pleasure. Suicide. One life's fear, another life's escape. Pain. One person's phobia, another person's euphoria. Depression. One soul's trap, another soul's target. Bullying. One human's hell, another human's glee. Hunger. Everyone's agony, but no one's dream. Lovely. Very nice. Very nice. That's kind of... There's a name, a name would be given to kind of the form or the approach you take there, it would be called a, sort of a list poem, where you kind of do a list of words and, and, and make some comment on them. Fight on the cards, take as many cards as you need, what you think the main barriers are to education for people in the world. Think what, what stops people. And when you've got your cards, put them around Fiona in a circle. Debbie Thomas worked with students from Bush Post Primary School, Dundalk, using creative writing and role play in the exploration of the themes of gender and education. Teacher Fiona Omuruku took a very active part. I want you to look at them and I want you to think what could be done to take away a particular barrier. And when you've thought of something, and it's got to be convincing and specific, so not too vague, put up your hand, and you're going to pick up the card, and you're going to tell us how you can take away that barrier. Okay? Yes? Um, disease, get more, um, get more people, like volunteers out to help uh, other charities help fight the disease. Yes, and how do you think they fight the disease? Uh, give them uh, medicine and train doctors to help them. Absolutely, so maybe doctors could train in other countries or money could be given to train doctors, more clinics built. Yep. Okay, another huge problem is gender. So, girls. And the there is, in some parts of the world, there's very little importance placed on, on girls going to school compared to boys. Can anyone think of a story in the news at the moment that deals with that is is really centered around that issue and um, the people uh, the girl school girls that were um they were abducted by a, um, a military group because they were saying that they weren't allowed to go to school and all. that's right does anyone know the name of the organization that has kidnapped the girls and it's boko haram and the meaning of the words boko haram is western education is sinful so what we're, going to do, what we're going to do now is imagine that you, you're going to get into groups and each group is going to be a school in that area. Because how do you think parents are feeling and school children are feeling in that area now? People who are still living there, you know, supposed to be going to school, how do you think they're feeling as a result of this kidnapping? God says, what's their religious leader? We'd like to send our children to school, but we're really afraid of what will happen them because other children have been kidnapped. The teachers will be able to keep the children calm and make sure that no one is hurt. And would they, who would they be negotiating with? Uh, they'd be negotiating with, like if there were, in worst case scenario, any terrorists, they'd make sure that all the children keep calm and lead them to many or other panic rooms located in these classrooms. Okay, so there's an escape route for the children. And there's a, a one, one mile uh, radius at checkpoint. Like, wow! Oh, wow. That would be good for the girls. That, that, that would be excellent, yeah. actually. So what happens then if somebody from Boko Haram comes to the checkpoint? What's going to happen? Yeah, but everyone's going to arrest. 
Oh, they'd be arrested. They'd be arrested with that. Our girls be in the bus anyway. Oh, that's true. So they'd yeah. be safe. Yeah. They'd be safe. Okay. okay. All right. The great thing about a villa now, as well, is that you, when you start off writing it, you just no way do you know what you're going to end up writing. It really is a case of like experimenting, just trusting your instincts, follow your nose, and just see where it leads. It's about as interesting as talking about the weather, <laughs> except we're playing with words, which is interesting. But supposing I change the whole way in which we're looking at this. It like gives it a, a, an irony or a poignancy or a different slant. Do you remember what we said about Emily Dickinson, the American poet? She said, if you want to tell the truth, tell it slant. Suppose I change the title to or hunger. This is somebody on the receiving end of a drought. Why does it always have to rain? Oh, over, like, over there in Ireland, <laughs> yeah? It's driving me insane. The weather here really gives me a pain. Oh, to be lying in warm sand. That's what they say in Ireland. Here I am, just lying in warm sand and nothing else, yeah? Everything's turning to sand. Why does it always have to rain? Huh, irony. What would we have to gain? Oh, raindrops falling on my hand. Yeah, the rain stick works. It's driving me insane. Do you see what we're doing? We've changed, we have a completely different perspective on the piece by just changing the title. You know, remember the last time we, we, we talked about how when you were writing the poems about child labour, about writing in like a code and how using a metaphor and finding a way of almost disguising what you're saying, so the reader is caught unawares. They're reading it and then they go, oh, wow. And in that moment of, whoa, wow, I get it, that's what you remember, because you've participated, you've worked it out. Pete Mullineau worked with students from Presentation Secondary School, Tune, exploring through the writing of poetry, the themes of hunger and gender. In their final session, Pete showed students how to write a villanelle on these themes. So, this is, this is the challenge, okay? I want you to have a go at writing a villanelle, which means you've got, you've got a pattern there in front of you, obeying the rules. And the rules are what we said, yeah? Just five, five three-line stanzas and a four-line stanza, every second line rhyming with, with each other first and third rhyming with each other, and the first and third lines repeated in that same form, yeah? And I want it to be about, either specifically about what we talked about today, which is gender, or it can be more to do with the whole project, about, you know, millennium goals, hunger, injustice, fairness, climate change, education, boys, girls, using words like value, worth, hope, fear, power, yeah? Anything you want that you feel that somehow allows the project that we've been looking at to somehow come into the poem. Now, having said that, you can see how we just started off writing about the weather. And then the sort of poem sort of creeps up on you. It, takes, it comes actually out, out by surprise. She did as the man told her so, and at her office desk she stayed, when the man in head office said no. It isn't fair or equal, she knows, but to God she prayed, for her future has nowhere to go. As the cost of living grows, her income begins to fade. The man in head office said no, and now her future has nowhere to go. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? Come on, give us a delay. That was good. Just by just trying, following your nose, just chancing your arm, just following your thoughts, allowing your voice to come up through, yeah? You ended up saying something really good. I like it's it's really really um, inventive poetic exploration of a, a particular issue, isn't it? And, we, and it's about and gender. It's about men and women. It's about what do you do when someone closes the door and says no? How do you respond? It's about power or en lack of power. It's about well, what's going to happen? It's kind of got an open-ended quality as well, isn't it? In terms of like. It depends, doesn't it? 